Good afternoon, Mr. Paul. Good afternoon, Ajahn. So today is the 22nd of July, of July, Wednesday. Thank you very much for taking a few more questions from disciples in various places who've been sending them. So today the first question um, is from someone who's asking uh, about the situation of elderly people who uh, get dementia and uh, this idea that one needs to think good thoughts at the time of death to be able to have a peaceful death or a good rebirth or whatever, good state of mind. <clears throat> and uh, so do people who have dementia can't really control their thoughts anymore or whatever happens to them? So they were asking about that situation. Could you say a few words about that, please? Well, I don't really know what happens when anyone dies, because I haven't died yet. And, uh, but I know that what doesn't die is consciousness. You know, so the body dies, the personality, the mental states, the emotions, they cease, the sense organs of the persons, Cease operating so they can't see, smell, taste, touch, think. But what doesn't die is consciousness. And this is very important. So when you realize the, the beauty of pure consciousness, you realize it's benevolent, it's metta, it's karuna. It's not a judgmental state that, that punishes or rewards anybody. <clears throat> so, you know, when there's so many stories about what happens after death and what you, your last thought should be or whatever, but I would give credit to anyone who has dementia, nothing, do not be afraid, because death is nothing to be feared. It's the natural state of what was born, what, not, what is born dies, what begins ends. <clears throat> so we can, you know, in dementia, the, the, the body's still functioning, uh, the, the thinking process isn't working properly. So, you know, the, the sense of being reasonable, rational, uh, in the, in the way that we consider normal is not operative. That's due to the disruption of the conditioning factors of the brain. So that's, that's also impermanent. The brain is impermanent. The uh, thoughts, feelings, emotions are impermanent. And, uh, and, they're, and they're not self, they're anatta. You know, they have a beginning in it. I mean, just like the Buddha kept repeating over and over again, the nature of Sankara is impermanent and not self. So I would advise people who are dealing with others who have dementia, who have Alzheimer's disease or these kind of uh, mental, emotional uh, disturbances, uh, best thing you can do is, is, is encourage them not to fear. Now, there's nothing to be afraid of. Dhamma is totally, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's metta karuna mudita upeka, it's the Brahma Viharas. It's peaceful, it's beautiful. And so that's not, that's nothing to be afraid of where, you know, the fear arises from thinking. You know, even a normal person, we, we can become terribly afraid when we start thinking about the future, what's going to happen with climate change, with the COVID-19 virus epidemic, what's going to happen to our economies, to our children, to our parents. You know, and the more you think, the more 
anxious or frightened you become because the future is doesn't exist you know it's it's always the here and now so you can imagine anything here and now about tomorrow about success failure good fortune bad fortune and that's always imagination in the present moment that you're creating with thoughts and the thinking process is for discrimination it's about the nature of sankaras thinking itself is a sankara so you can't think your way to nibbana because nibbana you know is the word itself implies a we sankara or not sankara not a condition it doesn't have a beginning or ending and it's to be realized to re be recognized because it's here and now it's not something remote distant far away that you have to reach for it's just learning to let go and be the knower of the present moment is like this Thank you. The next question is, um, someone was asking, uh, they've been meditating for some time or a few years now, and so they know all the instructions, what they're supposed to do, and yet, quite often when they sit down to meditate, this tension develops in the head, kind of, sometimes it reaches a state of a headache, sometimes not, they kind of back off a bit, but they were asking, what to do with that? What's happening there? Well, what's happening is there is there it's too much effort. You know, it's like, you know, oftentimes when you read instructions about meditation, it sounds like you have to put forth an enormous amount of effort, kind of volition or activities that you have to force the concentration and and sustain it and so forth. It's, and, and just observe the way these instructions affect you. You know, when you have a kind of instructions, information about how to practice, it can come across as, you know, as a command, as a demand, as a must, you must be like this. It should be, uh, these kind of words convey the, you know, to the average person conditioned by Western society that they've got to put forth enormous amount of effort to to realize nirvana, uh, and so you know many of us started out that way because that's the way we're conditioned. You know, I myself found that true. You know, when I put forth this enormous effort to concentrate, I get a headache, and um, this is why. You know, there's there's four different kinds of efforts, and they're not always, you know, the kind of effort that you need to lift the log onto a lorry, like when you're going to lift something heavy. Uh, you know, it takes an awful lot of effort to uh, bring up the log, the heavy log, and put put it into the lorry. Uh, and but you can't sustain that kind of effort. That's the kind of effort only for that particular kind of situation. Uh, you know, it doesn't work for meditation to, to use that kind of effort for, for meditation. Meditation is much more refined. So, you know, there's sustaining, there's bhavana, there's mindfulness, and this is, this is intuitive. The kind of effort is, is rather than pres a prescription that, uh, that someone gives you, it's an intuitive sense of balance and what is appropriate and how to sustain uh, or uh, how to let go. You know, letting go can sound like, you know, annihilation, getting rid of. It takes a lot of effort to, to try to destroy, get rid of, annihilate conditions in the, in the mind. And uh, that kind of effort will, will bring a, a headache. But uh, actually letting go is more relaxing. It's like, it's a, rather than throwing away, destroying anything, it's just relaxing, letting go of what you're grasping tightly. 
And this is this is where your intuitive awareness, the sati sampachanya, is necessary for you to to know the what how, how to balance. Like when a child is learning to walk, at first you know a a, a young child can't even walk, can't stand on its two legs. Uh, it needs to hold on to things, you know. So it starts crawling. It develops strength in its limbs through crawling around the floor, <clears throat> and then it starts holding on to the furniture and onto the mother's hand. And eventually, you know, it starts trying to walk by itself independently of the adults, and it falls down. But it gets up again and starts walking till it finds a balance. And that child is doing it intuitively. He's not, you know, if you if you just say, you've got two legs, walk, you know, that's rational, you know, <laughs> that any any creature with two legs can walk, but uh, that's not the way it is, you know, that's just a, a, a statement from the thinking mind. But if, you know, if you, you know, if you, you notice when young children are learning to walk, they can't walk very well in the beginning. They take a step and fall over, but then they don't think about, you know, I failed at walking, I can't walk. They, they just get up again and start over. You can't stop them, <laughs> no matter how many times they fall down. And you have to let them fall down, you know, and, and pick themselves up. And that's part of the the training, you know, with meditation, you're not always going to succeed, but, you know, you, you start again. You, you, don't, you don't think, well, I can't meditate because my mind wanders, or I have these obsessive thoughts, or, you know, when you start thinking about yourself as, as having a, a, you can't meditate, then that, you actually believe that, so you can't meditate. But if you don't believe that, like the, the young child learning to walk doesn't think I can't walk because the first few steps aren't very good. You know, just pick yourself up and start over again. So not to be afraid of the occasional headache and all the... Right, you know, just be, trust your, your own intuition to, to know what getting a headache is you're creating an incredible tension through through too much effort. So with a, like with a child who's start learning to start how to walk, there's an incentive there. Yeah. The incentive is to go to the parent or go and discover the world or something. And what's the motivation in meditation when some people just sort of fail and they feel depressed? How do they motivate themselves again? Like to to realize nirvana. That's why we're doing. Why we become monks, isn't it? You know, you don't become a monk to to get worldly success or wealth or fame. You don't care about that. But why, why do we give up maybe ambition and worldly ambitions to become a a monk in Thailand is to realize the truth, to wake up and realize, the, you know, the Dhamma, the reality of our own existence, rather than just trying to get something that looks attractive, you know, as some kind of goal that, you know, like, uh, you know, a bait to attract you to go forward. Uh, I mean, when, when we all ordain, we take up Samadhis to realize Nirvana. And I even explain this to monks who ordain for the Pansa. You know, they're doing it to, to fulfill the, you know, the, the custom of Thai custom to ordain temporarily. But you still have to say to realize Nirvana, whether you mean it or not. But, you know, I really took that seriously when I ordained. I didn't ordain because it's not my cultural conditioning to do that, it's, it's, it's going against my cultural conditioning. Why would I, someone like myself, an American, decide to come to Thailand and ordain, not for worldly gain, but for 
awakeness, for enlightenment, for understanding. So if I may, Lung Paul, the people who are going to be watching this video are not all monks. And I guess I know that some lay people sometimes have find it a, bit, a little bit uh, difficult to connect with that goal of Nibbana. It seems very remote and inaccessible. And they too yet would like to meditate and find ways of motivating themselves in the meditative learning process. Well, nowadays meditation is de rigueur, isn't it, uh, worldwide to really, um, you know, to calm the mind, you know, so that's a good goal too, you know, whether you don't have to, to be a monk to meditate, even to realize Nirvana, you don't have to be a monk or a samana. You know, you, that would be, you know, because Nibbana is here and now. It's not something, something that only, you know, ascetics can realize. And Dhamma is here and now. It's not something that only monks can take refuge in or realize. Dhamma is, is the way things are. It's here and now. It's not something high up that that you have to live a specially uh, disciplined life to realize. And this, but it's learning to, to open to life itself, to open with awareness, with intuitive awareness, this sense of not just uh, an analysis or thinking, because that's not, that's not aware, that's just defining, that, that gives names and, and values and qualities to condition phenomena, but intuition, as I use this word, intuition, uh, intuitive awareness, is more on the heart level. It's, uh, it's opening to life, you know, to receive the way it is as in the present moment. And so that's where, that's what direct meditation is about, is, is this sense of opening and trusting in awareness in mindfulness, in conscious awareness, in intuitive awareness, to be able to recognize that which recognizes the state of mind. If you, you know, sometimes monks, people are intimidated by monks because we, we kind of have a form that, that lay people don't have, the form itself is designed to, to uh, encourage mindfulness. But just the form is not enough. It's just an empty form like anything else. Uh, and so it's not to, to, to see and be intimidated by uh, monk, Buddhist monks or nuns, but to realize that it's the human birth, this human form, the form itself, gives us this reflective ability to observe, to be the witness to the flow of life as we individually experience it. So, so we can't really, you know, it's not about uh, attaching to a form because we can be attached to monastic forms and not see through them. You know, that is not uncommon just to, to be attached to, to the form of monastic life and, and not realize the attachment, the identity the, that, that we're uh, having in regard to the form that, that the Buddha established. But the form is merely a, 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 you know, an expedient means to realize Dhamma here and now. So, it, and it's also, you know, you, I've often contemplated why did the Buddha saying to Ananda before he passed away was, I give you the Dhamma and the Vinaya. The, the form of Vinaya actually, you know, has maintained its, itself through uh, time, since the time of the Buddha to the present situation here and now. It's a form that has survived, you know, through 2,500 years 
of, of developing and degenerating and reviving and so forth. So you look at the history of Buddhism and it, it has a history of, you know, of, of being abundant and worldwide religion to being almost disappearing from the planet to being revived again, because the form uh, it allows that to happen, it allows to, to carry the Dhamma teaching from the past into the present moment. But it's, it's merely an expedient means, it's not an end in itself. So as one learns to relax in meditation and sort of get in touch with this kind of more intuitive mm -hmm. sense, awareness, and then some people kind of start experiencing the mind, the thinking kind of slows down and sometimes goes quiet at times. They're still noticing, they're still seeing, hearing, smelling, whatever. The senses are still operating, but there's all of a sudden this sense of quiet in the mind. and. Uh, what is that and how to use it in the practice? Well, when you, you know, when like, you can't make yourself quiet, you know, using the effort, strong effort to, to quiet the mind. Uh, you know, you can suppress feelings and thoughts and that through willpower, but you can't, it's unsustainable. It bounces, it rebounds back. Uh, and, it, and that's where you get the headaches uh, and the tension. The body is, becomes full of tension. Now your body is a sankhara, you know. So by making it tense, you know, it, this thing, you know, it's uh, creating uh, suffering, unpleasant sensations, unpleasant uh, feelings in the body through through effort. But when you relax more, when you let go, when you, and, and letting go in this sense, pahana, uh, the effort of, what is it, pahana, letting go is, is not, as I said before, not annihilating or destroying anything, but relaxing. So this is very important, when you relax, and, and stop trying so hard, then uh, you, you start, the thinking process can, can slow down to where you, you're not intentionally thinking anymore, but you're still conscious. The senses still operate. You can still see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Thoughts come and go, but you're not intentionally thinking, creating thoughts and going from one thought to another. And that's, you know, that's very important to recognize that the, 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 the consciousness, vacant consciousness, without getting caught up in thinking and reacting to emotions, is peaceful. This is where, you know, I had my first real insight into what peace really is, is this is natural consciousness itself is peaceful. It's not, you know, it's not exciting, it's not depressing, it's not, you know, so the emotions are all about excitement and depression. But, so on an emotional level, it's, it's equanimous, it's equanimity, uh, it's upeka, you know, so it's it, to, to respect that. And the very thought, what do I do next, is just the habit tendency of your thinking mind to, to think there's something more to do, when actually there's nothing more to do in that silence, that peace uh, of conscious awareness. But then as a personality, as a conditioned phenomenon, uh, we always assume there's, there's something that can't be this simple, you have to do something. Uh, you know, there's something more I've got to do to get, get rid of something or get hold of something or to hold on to this upeka, this equanimity. And, you know, so the thinking mind, you know, when you're 
when you're just depending upon upeka or quietness or equanimity as experience, you can create a desire for it. When it disappears, then you want it again. So we have to be aware of these desires, like the wanting something you don't have. Once you've had that experience, that insight into Jitwang, into the empty consciousness, empty can, oh, conscious awareness, uh, it, the thinking mind starts creating desires because you you don't stay there. You 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 start. What what do I do next after this? What comes after this? Or where am I? a stream enterer or, or whatever, you start thinking about yourself or about attainment or, or you start questioning or doubting. This is all the thinking process. So encouragement to, to let go of thinking. You can't think your way to Nibbana. You can't desire Nibbana. You know, the desire is the very obstruction to Nibbana, the thing that veils it, that hides it from us all the time is the three kinds of desire. Gama, Dana, desire for sensual pleasures, Bhava, Dana, desire for becoming, Vipo, Dana, desire for annihilation. So desire is to be let go of. It's the second noble truth, the insight is to let go of desire. To let go you have to know what desire is. You can't just intellectually try to let go of desire because you don't you not you don't understand desire. You don't you you haven't had the intuitive acceptance of desires like this. You you just take the the uh, affirmative position of to get rid of desires to realize nibbana. It doesn't work that way. You have to recognize essential desires like this, desire for becoming, desire for nibbana, desire for enlightenment is like this, desire to get rid of the defilements, the kilesas, um, the faults, the, the misery, the suffering is like this. And you, you know, this is intuition, this is not rational. It's not about rationally uh, deciding to get rid of desire, but understanding desire makes you, allows you to let go of it because you see your, your condition to cling to it, to identify with desire. The whole psychedity, the whole ego structure of every one of us is, is this based on this desire, this clinging to desire. And, and so as long as that is never recognized or understood. That's how we're even with meditation, with Buddhist meditation, we're going to, to use these desires for attainment, for achievement, and desire to get rid of the defilements, get rid of kilesas, get rid of anger, get rid of jealousy, fear, and greed. <clears throat> you know, to as long as we operate from these, these three kinds of desires, then we, we never, you know, we can't let go. We're, we're attached and that creates tension and unpleasantness in the body and in the mind. So in the second noble truth, you know, the first truth is a statement, there is suffering. And the, the second noble truth is about the origin, the causes of suffering is this attachment clinging, identifying with the three kinds of desires. And it's uh, and the way to understand suffering is to accept it, to really observe it, be the puto, puru, the, the witness to suffering, to anxieties like this. Like consciousness, intuitive awareness, isn't desire, it doesn't desire anything. The, uh, anyway, the uh, personality has all kinds of desires, good desires, bad desires, you know, whatever they, you know, whatever quality they have from the best to the worst, there's still desires, there's still sankharas, there's still 
the, the that which hinders us from realizing the amata dhamma or the ultimate reality. So just to to encourage you to see that Dhamma is uh, here and now, so it's not not just for some you know, not some kind of abstract metaphysical concept, uh, Buddhist philosophy. It's you know to be it's apparent. It's here and now. We know we're conscious. Consciousness is not a mystery, but it's you can't define it. You can't uh, objectify it in any way because. You are consciousness itself, and and that so you can't find yourself as an object, but you begin to understand the the way that we blind ourselves by identifying with suffering, with desires, with the sense uh, experiences, with the uh, ambitions, the aspirations that we create of what we would like, what we want to get with our desire to get rid of the evil forces, the, the negative states of mind, the depression, uh, and that which is aware of these desires is not desire. It's intuitive awareness, consciousness, mindfulness, whatever words uh, you choose, these words mean the same thing. It's mean seeing the, the way it is that all conditions are impermanent. And that the Dhamma, consciousness itself, is anatta. It's not personal. It's not like my consciousness and your consciousness and then male consciousness or female consciousness. Consciousness has no gender, doesn't belong to a person, but it's here and now. And it's what we really are when we let go of the delusions that we create through our attachment to desires.